In the next section, I want to discuss a lower bound for sorting and impossibility results. That basically implies that the two methods we've just seen, merge sort and quick sort, are almost best possible, but in a specific sense. And uh, I want you to dig behind this superficial statement uh, so that you know what it means. A bit of, in more detail, a lower bound in algorithms is usually a synonym for uh, there's no uh, there's an, is, is a synonym for an impossibility result. There's no algorithmic there's no algorithm that can do better than a certain certain um, performance, and it has to be mathematically proven. So it's a uh, it must be a rigorous statement. And in, in that sense, it's a super powerful concept because it means if you have an algorithm that's close to that bound, you can stop searching, right? Um, so a bit, I compared it to this conservation of energy principle in physics earlier. That's, that's the kind of generality that we're hoping for. Uh, and it seems to, be, seems to be somewhat unique for computer science to get so, uh, so close to these lower bounds. Um, you will often hear this, this algorithm is optimal for that problem. I don't love that term because it often means, it often hides things under the rug. Uh, it's often better to unpack what optimal really means. And the whole point of this and the next subsession is to sense, make, make you a bit sensi sensitive to uh, uh, what's hidden behind when people call an algorithm optimal. Right, but what, what do we have to do to prove such statements? Um, I want to point out that this is essentially a statement for all algorithms. It holds that their running time is at least this or this. That's the kind of statement we're, we're looking for. So we need to prove a statement for all possible algorithms. So that's, um, that's quite a tough, tough order, tall order. And in particular, we need a notion to say, what are all possible algorithms? So any lower bound assumes a model of computation, necessarily. It could be, if it's powerful, it could be the RAM model, the one that we discussed for analyzing algorithms. Um, but often, lower bounds restrict computation to something even more primitive, just to make reasoning about the model easier. And that's what we'll do here as well. Um, what we'll use is the comparison model, which is a standard model also outside of, of this specific use case. Uh, this model says, OK, I'm abstracting very much away from computers what they actually do. I only count when they um, compare two objects. But that's also the only thing they can do. So I can take two objects in an array. I can compare them. And I'll tell you which one's smaller. Uh, and you can move, uh, move elements around. But uh, I'm not going to charge you for this. So. The cost for running an algorithm is just, um, is just these two operations. I don't charge you for how to come up with your decisions. And you could even say um, the lower bound we'll, we'll use is even more strict. It, it only counts the comparisons. It doesn't care at all about moving things around. So this sounds like a silly machine, right? We don't have computers that work like this. But for lower bounds, that's, that's kind of good. This makes very few assumptions. You can build many different machines that can compare elements and move them around. And for a lower bound, that's good because it means the statement we'll get is more general. So usually for algorithms, a more detailed model is better because then you can real model reality closer. But for lower bounds, the opposite is true. The important bit here is that both merge sort and quick sort are inside this model. You can formulate them so that they only work by comparing elements and moving them around. We've basically done that in, in my high level explanation anyways. So they're, they're part of this model. They're captured by what we'll say. And now comes the, the big important step. So this is, this is the, uh, the key insight that we have to take. I don't know. Uh, how can I highlight this without cluttering it up too much? The model has this nice property that we can say what algorithms in this model look like. Specifically, because they're only allowed to compare elements, all they can really uh, do to base decisions on are comparisons. And comparisons in this model, this is uh, 
only one type of comparison, say less or equal. So it has two outcomes, yes or no. And then the algorithm is not allowed to do anything else with the object. So everything it has to do with moving them around has to be based on the yes or no answer from comparisons. So in that sense, um, we can model computation by having comparison nodes where there's two possible outcomes. And then the, prop the, the, the algorithm branches in two possibilities. It either follows a left or a right path. We ignore any movement of data in between. So instead, we'll only look at the comparisons. And what next comparison is done can, of course, depend on what you've done before. So you have two different subtrees. Um, but that's, that's pretty much all. Let me show you an example. I think that's clearer. Uh, so this is um, for a very small array for three elements one possible algorithm in this comparison model. How does the algorithm work? It starts by comparing the, the first two elements, position 0 and 1. And what I denoted below the nodes is the possible orderings of the input that are still uh, feasible or compatible with where we currently are. So I compare the first two elements, and the two outcomes are either a 0 is smaller or not. Um, then you can filter out what that means for the different input orders. And in this case, the algorithm doesn't actually uh, change what it does. It does the same comparison in both cases. So if uh, a0 is smaller than a1, it checks if a1 is also smaller than a2. If that is the case, then the input was already sorted. We know that then. And the algorithm could then decide not to rearrange anything. Otherwise, if we go in this branch, so we know a0 is smaller than a2, but uh, a1 was bigger than a2, then we still have to compare the first and last element. And depending on how that goes, um, we know that the input had this order originally. And in both cases, the algorithm could then decide, ah, OK, now I know what to do, and just reassign the elements so that, it's, that it becomes sorted. That's how this, so this is how, in the comparison model, algorithms look like. They're comparison trees where the nodes tell you, these are the two positions in the original array I want to compare. Those are the two outcomes. And depending on that, the next thing happens. The important bit is that every algorithm in the comparison model can be formulated as such a tree. So we have a way to reason about all possible algorithms by studying all possible trees. And trees are much easier to handle than general algorithms with whatever complicated code. And now comes the step where we use this, this knowledge, what all, all algorithms look like, to get an impossibility statement. First of all, uh, this is one concrete algorithm, but it's the algorithm shown on all possible inputs in the tree. If I have one specific input, for example, this one, what will happen is that I, I always follow this path down the tree. Because that's what actually happens if I call the algorithm with this input. So one execution of the algorithm is a path from the root down to a leaf. And on every step, I make one comparison. Because that's the way we define this tree. Every step down is doing one comparison, and nothing else happens in between that we count. That means the height of the comparison tree is the maximal number of comparisons this algorithm ever does on any input. In other, in other words, that's the worst case number of comparisons that this algorithm does. But that's still talking about one concrete algorithm, this, this kind of tree that, we, that I drew here. The next piece is, ha, ah, these are binary trees. I only have two outcomes. And uh, we've talked about this before. If I have a binary tree uh, with a certain number of nodes, I can compute how tall it has to be. I can lower bound its height. Uh, here it's very slightly different. Instead of having the internal nodes, we have the number of leaves, but it's, it's very similar. It's even easier in a way. Um, if you have two leaves, then you need at least height one. If you have four leaves, then 
the most balanced thing seems intuitively to give you the the less the, the least tall tree. Uh, so the height, if you have L leaves, um, is at least log L, because whenever you get one step down, you can at most double the number of leaves. That's all that's behind this. So we now have a statement that if we have a number of leaves, we need a certain height. The last thing to nail this down is again now using something about the problem we're trying to solve. We're trying to sort a list of n elements. Now we need to do a little bit of combinatorics. How many different orderings are there if I have n elements? The number is 1 up through n. There's n factorial of those. n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 and so on. Many different ways to see this, but you could say um, I first pick the position for the largest number n. I put that somewhere in my array. Then I have n minus 1 choices for the next number, for the number n minus 1. So I'll put n minus 1 in one of those n minus 1 choices that I've left. So in each step I have one less choice, but each of those I can combine. That's what n factorial comes from. So a sorting algorithm needs to work differently on every different input or permutation. It's supposed to sort the input, so the output should always look the same, irrespective of the order original. So it has to do different operations, otherwise it wouldn't end up with the same state from a different input. Right? Sorry, say it again. Yep. Um, so the way to read this, um, that statement here is saying we don't have more than one of these orderings in any of the leaves. To turn this into a sorting algorithm, this is basically just uh, the, the reconnaissance stage. It's just the recon part, learning in what order the elements are. And then you would have another step that rearranges them into sorted order. The important part is the rearrangement needs to look different for every possible input order. Pardon? Yeah, here it's already sorted. Here I have to swap the last two. For each of those, you can define a number of swaps. Let's maybe take it offline. Um, uh, the, the key point here is you need a different leaf for every possible input permutation, because you have to act differently to turn it into sorted order. So that means if we want to sort n elements, we have to have n factorial leaves. We know for so many leaves, we need log of that as height. And uh, log of n factorial is roughly n log n. So you can upper bound it and lower bound it. To be more precisely, you can give statements like this. Uh, but that's not my, my key point. Um, it's enough if you, if you keep that in mind and that it's asymptotically equivalent to n log n. So that means, what does that mean? That was the lower bound on the height of the comparison tree, on any comparison tree. And the height was the worst case number of comparisons. So that means um, any algorithm, any comparison tree, any algorithm in the comparison model must do at least n log n comparisons in the worst case. Um, merge sort actually achieves this, including the right constant in front of the leading term. So it's in that sense, uh, including the linear, the linear, the constant factor, it's uh, it's optimal for comparisons. Um, yes, uh, if you if you want to zoom in a bit closer, it's still open whether we can do this. Um, there's a slider question looking at the concrete comparison tree. I'll leave that for you to have a look at at home. Um, it's not so vital. So let's, uh, let's leave it with that. Um, just to recap again, very briefly, the steps. We formulate a model for all algorithms. In this case, that was all comparison trees. 
we use something about the problem that we're trying to solve, sorting in this case, to argue that this, all these problems, all these programs have to have a specific shape. In this case, all of them need to have many leaves. And then arguing from the shape of the programs that it's a binary tree, you can tell something about the cost. And that gives you a way to lower bound the cost. So every algorithm in this model needs to use so many comparisons. 